and welcome to ASCO 2023 Key Updates in Lung Cancer as a uh, GRACE program. GRACE is the global resource for advancing cancer education. I'll be hosting and moderating this program. I'm uh, Dr. Jack West. I am a medical oncologist focused in thoracic oncology, associate professor at the City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center in the Los Angeles area. I'm also the founder and president of GRACE, and I'm very happy to be joined today by two friends and colleagues. And if there's a, a positive residual effect of the pandemic and us moving to a lot of virtual programs, it's made it easier to do programs uh, more flexible in geography and timing so that we can have broader uh, participation by by people who aren't necessarily uh, in the same room as often as we'd like to be. So with that, let me introduce uh, my two uh, guests for today. Uh, the first is Dr. Alfredo Adeo, if you could uh, just introduce yourself and uh, how what you'd want the audience to know about you. Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Jake. I'm thrilled uh, to be part of this uh, session with you and with Christine. Um, so my name is Alfredo there. I'm a thoracic medical oncologist. I'm the head of the oncology service here in Geneva University Hospital and uh, uh, really honor uh, to be able to go through very interesting data today. Excellent. And also Dr. Christine Lovely. Hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here with you today. My name is Christine Lovely. I'm a thoracic uh, lung cancer doctor at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Thank you so much for being with us today. It'll be a great discussion. Great. So let's get started. We have a lot of interesting material to cover. And uh, the first that I wanted to bring up, which it's probably fitting to introduce discussion of lung cancer at uh, at ASCO by what might introduce us to a diagnosis of lung cancer, and that's this issue of screening. And And I would just start by saying that lung cancer screening has a demonstrated uh, clear benefit for early detection and improvement in survival. Uh, and this is largely in patients, uh, or the, the most of the studies have been in patients from 50s on up, uh, and uh, with a significant smoking history, often 30 pack years or so, uh, the pack years being the, the product of how much people have smoked in packs per day and the number of years. But uh, we've also recognized that there are patients who don't have that smoking history and who might be younger uh, than, than 50s, 60 years old, as, as many of the targeted patients are, who are at risk for lung cancer. And uh, this trial called FANS for Female Asian Never Smoker Screening Study focuses on never smoking Asian women as young as 40 years old with a recognition that a lot of these folks wouldn't be captured by any screening study because they because of their age and, and lack of a smoking history. And yet we do see this in some patients. And this was a study um, that, uh, that sought a thousand uh, patients uh, from multiple centers. There was a careful discussion of the pros and cons. One of the issues of doing screening is potentially finding things that aren't cancer, but end up uh, either uh, triggering or uh, at least discussion of, if not necessitating further workup of, of things that might not end up being cancer. So some potential anxiety there, et cetera. But uh, the, the screening process included a low dose screening chest CT. So not very much radiation in this, but uh, a lot more detail than an x-ray, as well as looking at circulating DNA, circulating free DNA uh, from plasma. And uh, what was the take home message of this was that there were cancers detected, even in this never smoking population, not just that cancers were detected, but the rate of detection was comparable to the rate seen in uh, broader studies in, in smokers that we traditionally think of as the subject of our screening, where we've typically seen rates in the 1% to 2% range. These patients were all found to have disease at an early stage. They underwent resection. These patients actually had EGFR mutations, which is one of the things that we might think of for a never smoker, and they're on postoperative uh, osimertinib to griso, a topic we'll get to. 
And uh, so this is really a success for the principle of screening, not just in the traditional significant smoker group, but even particularly in patients who are uh, who are never smokers, but who we have come to recognize have some uh, risk of the cancer uh, of a never of a never smoker lung cancer. And so I'm interested in thoughts about this. I think we need to underscore that this is not a big randomized trial that uh, necessarily is going to lead to changes in practice. Uh, but I'd, I'd be really interested in uh, what you all think this this should teach us and what the implications are. Maybe I can start with you, uh, Christine, just to, I know this was of particular interest to you. So what do you take away from this? Where do you think we are going forward? Yeah, thanks so much, Jack. I, I'm going to zoom out for a second and say, it is, I think, universally accepted that if we have screening tests for any cancer, we, our goal is to catch cancer early so that we can intervene early and go for curative intent therapies. So cancer screening across the board is incredibly important. And to me, you know, innovative methods for cancer screening are, are always exciting. And, and this was an abstract I was very excited about. I will also say that lung cancer screening in the United States and worldwide, like Jack said, it, it has a proven benefit for survival, but it is underutilized. So if you are listening to this podcast, if you are watching this video, Please, if you are eligible for lung cancer screening, if you're thinking about lung cancer screening, ask your provider, should I get lung cancer screening? Because it is very important. It changes survival. It is underutilized. That is an important take home message. That is predominantly in smokers right now or people who have a history of smoking. But that we know that, that there is a significant portion of patients with lung cancer, about 20%, who have lung cancer who have never smoked cigarettes. And how do we screen for lung cancer in those patients in, in a very broad population? And this particular study is exciting to me because it recognizes that in certain populations of patients, in this case, women from, from East Asia, we know that that population of patients is enriched for a certain type of lung cancer, EGFR mutated lung cancer. And this study specifically looked at that group of patients. And, and I think it, it was very innovative in terms of the enrollment, in terms of you know, deploying um, a, a technology in, a, in a, just a different subset of patients, in finding the patients early. And I think this will continue to grow over time. So I'm very enthusiastic about this study. I, I, I want to resonate what Jack said. This is a particular group of patients, women from East Asia, it is not broad strokes yet for all never smokers. I believe that we'll get there. Um, but right now we're starting with this East Asian women never smokers um, to find lung cancer early. Zooming out big picture, lung cancer screening, cancer screening in general, very important. Uh, I think in the horizon and in the five to 10 year horizon, we're gonna have very innovative blood tests and other screening modalities coming down the pipeline for lung cancer and other cancers. So I'm, I'm eagerly awaiting those. I think it's a really good point that I had, anytime I'm thinking of lung cancer screening, I'm thinking that one of the key corollaries is we are not doing it enough. I mean, we don't do as much screening even for colon or uh, cervical cancer, things that are also of, of great value, uh, breast cancer, we have much more success with. There's more nihilism, more pessimism about uh, about lung cancer screening. It's just uh, very, very underutilized in general. So that is not the focus. That population is not the focus here, but I think it really needs to be underscored anytime we're talking about screening. It really needs to be underscored. And just to really drive this home, 5% of eligible patients in the United States are screened, 5%. And so we need to do much better for, for this from this perspective because we want people, if they do have lung cancer, to be detected early so they can go for curative intent therapy. Now, Alfredo, uh, you're coming from Europe. I, I don't know how prevalent lung cancer screening is in the smoker populations where it's a target. Uh, most of our comments about low rates of screening are in a U.S. population. But, you know, what are your thoughts about uh, the screening situation and the implications here where, you know, the, I don't know if you have very many female Asian never yeah. smokers anywhere around you? 
So um, thank you for the question. I think uh, Christina just uh, you know summarized perfectly um, in, for this particular study. Now for the general situation in Europe, then I've worked in different countries, but what happened is that it very much depends on the country you live. Uh, so for the vast majority of the screening for breast cancer or for the cervical cancer or even uh, colorectal cancer, in many countries, if you have um, an approved screening, you get the letter. So it's not necessarily the, 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 the person, the people and the, and the patient, let's say, that have got to be proactive, but they get a letter. So, and uh, with specific, as soon as they hit the target, it could be the age, very often is the age, they get a letter inviting them to attend these screening. And it's the same in Switzerland. Now for lung cancer screening is slightly different as there is an agreement in principle that it is helpful, but many countries are struggling to, um, to build pathways basically. Um, so, it is in Switzerland, it is um, paid for, but again, as there's no clear pathway, only a vast mi just a minority of, um, of people are exposed to this gaining. So it very much depends on the GP. So it's not yet, we're not there yet. So I don't have the, the number, the percentage, but I suspect that in Switzerland, I, I think that the number might be quite low. Um, and going back to your question about the specific um, screening, of course, in Switzerland, we don't have high um, you know, prevalence of um, Asiatic um, you know, population. We do have some. So uh, this is fascinating and very interesting. And of course, you want, I don't think it will have an impact necessarily in, in Switzerland and in Europe, but it is still very fascinating. Okay. Well, great. Uh, so uh, we'll see further work, I think, in this realm. And yeah. uh, so stay tuned.